you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13, look at our message, the false prophet. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18 is our passage. And once again, if you're new to our fellowship, our style around here is to teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and go through the books of the Bible, because I believe that's the way God intended for his word to be discovered. You know, in the early church, they would just get up on Sunday morning when they got a letter from Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians, they would just read the whole letter, or they got the letter from uh, John the Apostle, which was a letter that went to seven different churches. They'd just read the whole letter from beginning to end. And so we don't read it from beginning to end in one setting, but break it up in and, and verses that we can talk about what's going on, try to explain it, and also see some application for our lives. In chapter 13, we have what is called the unholy trinity or the trinity of evil. And that is Satan in the future, as we're going to see the great tribulation that's going to take place, Satan finally has his guy, the Antichrist, a political leader. He will be the president or prime minister over the United States of Europe with the 10 nations or 10 regions that are involved. That currently is uh, not come to fruition, but it is yet a future event. And this prime minister, this president of the United States of Europe, who is energized by Satan himself, he's a demon-possessed guy, in world power, which is kind of scary. But he has a PR man. He has what is known as the false prophet. And this is a guy that touts him and tells everybody that they should worship and bow down to this president or this prime minister. And he's kind of an unusual character because as we'll see here, basically three things. He wants to deceive the people. He wants to impress the people. And he also wants to pressure the people in bowing down to the new world leader. He wants to bring about government registration that everybody has to register, everybody has to bow, and if not, your life's on the line. It is a government uh, mandated worship and bowing to the president of the United States of Europe. We know him to be the Antichrist. But I think when you always use the name Antichrist rather than how he's described, you kind of get this thinking that, I mean, he's this guy in bla a black cape and this little pencil handlebar mustache kind of looks like snidely whiplash from Dudley Do-Right. And, and you expect him to come on, like he's going to be this real evil guy and everybody's going to see him coming. But that's not the case. Do you know that the devil is a great deceiver? Now, the devil does not show up at your door, knock on the door in his red pajamas with his pitchfork and his horns. Stand and there's, hello, I'm Satan. I've come to destroy your life, your marriage, and get your kids hooked on drugs and just wipe you out. So if you would just acquiesce and give in right now, we'd just get this over with. I would destroy your life. Now, if he showed up that way, most people would bolt their door and go hide in the basement or something and try to get away from him. But he doesn't do that. What does he do? He, he's a deceiver. The art of deception is to make something look good and sound good on the surface and to hide the lie that is usually about 5% of the message or 10% of the message that death is coming your way or an eternity separated from God. It's this incredible deception, just as he told Adam and Eve in the garden when he came along with that deception of a serpent when he showed up. He said, can you eat of this tree? And she says, no, we can't eat of that tree or even touch it because the day we do, we'll die. But the devil lies to her and says, oh, the day you eat of it, you won't surely die, but God knows that you'll become like God. And so the deception was, oh, you're not gonna die, but they did die spiritually that day, and ultimately they died physically. But he deceived them into thinking, God's holding out on you. There's something that God doesn't want you to know, and that's always intriguing to the human heart. Well, you're holding out? What, what are you holding out? Is there some joy or pleasure or thrill that I'm going to have if I partake of your temptation? So the deception, this false teacher that comes on the scene, number one, we seize a deceiver. As we pick it up in verse 11 and 12, he's wanting to deceive those during that period of time. It says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. 
Now, two weeks ago, we shared with you about the Antichrist that there's an assassination attempt on this political leader. This is all yet future tense. This is yet out in front of us somewhere. Some, you know, is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? We don't know. But we know it's yet future. And so this guy that was wounded and has basically had a fake resurrection or at least a miraculous healing, this false prophet wants everybody to worship him. But how we know he comes to deceive this false prophet, his PR man, his public relations guy, is that it says that he has two horns like a lamb. He's pictured as a lamb. Jesus told us and warned us about false teachers that come along and they are wolves in sheep's clothing. Because people know, as I said, the devil knows that he can't deceive you by just being direct. He has to be indirect and look good. Now, is there anything more, um, I don't know, innocent looking than a lamb? Years ago when my little girl was small, she was probably maybe about eight years old, she wanted a lamb. So we went down to the auction and we went through the old McDonald farm thing. You know, we lived out in the country. We went through chickens and the kids let them all freeze to death. And we went to, through, uh, you know, we went through all these animals. We had a horse, we had some goats and, and my daughter, we wanted to get a lamb. So we went down and we bought at the auction this cute little lamb and Jessica named him Fuzzums. And anytime I think of a lamb, I think of Fuzzums. Fuzzums was so cute and woolly and cuddly and, and you could hug him. And it was just, you know, it was just one of those things that seems so innocent, so non-threatening as a sheep can be. And yet this Antichrist comes along with the metaphor is that picture of somebody that's so innocent, so spiritual, so nice, has all of your concerns on their heart. Whatever's on your heart is on their heart. And they really come across that way. But as it says, he looks like a lamb with these two horns, but his voice is the voice of a dragon. Satan is the energizer behind this very lamb looking individual. Now, I think this is the danger in all of our lives, not only future tense for those who are going to have to deal with this lamb looking false prophet, but when the devil comes to deceive you, he's going to do it with people that are wolves in sheep's clothing. That's why it's hard to kind of figure it out. Somebody that looks real good on the outside, they sound real good, but you think deep in your heart as the Lord gives you discernment, there's just something not right about that person. And over the years, being involved with church and leadership in church, we have had issues where people come in and they look like a sheep on the outside, but there's something not right. And they're really looking to somehow take advantage. They're a deceiver. We had this one guy that came to church and man, this guy looked like the whole package. He had this great big Bible, looked like it weighed about 10 pounds. And, and he came to church and when he came to church, he always brought with him this handicapped person. He was so kind to the handicapped person and everybody kind of went, oh. And he would take the person forward if they wanted prayer and this or that. But me and a couple of the guys, we thought, we talked to him. And there was just something deep inside of us. And there's something not right about this guy. He looks good on the outside. He looks like a lamb. And so we were really concerned. And so a, a guy called from somewhere else in town. And he said, hey, is so-and-so going to your church? We said, yeah, he is. And he said, watch out for him. Watch out for him well, what's your name? I'm not going to give you my name because I'm afraid of him, but watch out for him. So we already were concerned. And so now we have this person who says, watch out for him. Now, what do you do with that? I mean, what are you going to do? He still looks good. Everybody's like, oh, he's so wonderful. He's so spiritual. He's saying praise the Lord and this and that. And we kept watching him. And we, we talked to him. We went and talked to him. We said, hey, we had a phone call about you. Just kind of warn uh, us about you. But we didn't have any evidence. And so we were trying to think maybe he would be forthright. And he told us we were judging him and, and condemning him. And then we all felt bad. Like, yeah, we don't, we don't know. Something's wrong. Well, then finally we got a phone call from somebody that did and was willing to kind of spill the beans on him. This guy would go to churches and he would look exactly like that, like a lamb. And then what he would do in the course of fellowship and stuff, he'd say, oh, people would say, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm, I'm not working right now, but I got this business idea. And man, it's a killer business idea. If I just had the capital, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, I would just make somebody a lot of money. And, and he would take people in because everybody saw him as very spiritual. He toted his Bible. He said, praise the Lord. He helped handicap people. And then when the people, and there were a number of people in about three or four different states that we ultimately talked to, that he had taken them for their entire life savings. 
in the churches. And when you talk to these people, they were breathing fire. They were so mad about this guy. But it was hard. And as soon as we got their names and where they lived, this guy was out of here. Because now when we confronted him, we had the goods. But all along, we felt like there is just something not right. The Lord calls you and I to be discerning. If we're not discerning, we can be deceived. In the future, this Antichrist, he comes across looking like a lamb, but his voice is that of a dragon, Satan himself. And he has all of the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist. And in his presence, he wants everybody, his messages, worship him, bow down to him. And we know it's wrong when the Lord tells us to worship him only, that we're not to bow to a man or we're not to bow to an image. One of the brothers in our church got involved with a false religious sect of sorts, and, and he had grew up in the church. He had been raised in the church, and he was in one of these meetings, and he had been going to a number of these meetings, and at this meeting, they brought in a big poster of the spiritual leader of this movement, this big poster, and everybody began to praise that man and kind of bow to him, and it was at that moment that the lights went on, and he thought, what have I got involved with? These people are bowing to this guy on a poster. Get me out of here, and he got away from that thing, but the devil's very subtle. He's very crafty in his methodology. Well, he not only is deceptive in his appearance of innocence, but he also wants to impress the world at that time with his miraculous powers. Look at it in verses 13 through 15. It says, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now your imagination has to work with me here a little bit as we see this future prophetic thing. First of all, this public relations guy, imagine there's a media conference going on. And just as our president has his media representative come out there, secretary of the press, if you will, press secretary, he comes out and tells the people about what the president's doing and policies and answers things. Well, this guy, if he comes up and if you could picture it in your mind, this is obviously located in the United States of Europe, but he's the press secretary. And if you want to impress somebody, you just call some fire down from heaven. Now that'll wow some people, right? Hey, how do we know you have this authority or this power? Fire comes from heaven. He was granted to be able to do these signs and wonders so that people will believe. The mistake that humans so often make is they will believe the miraculous, whether it is divine and from the Lord in nature, or if it's demonic or from the devil in nature. The devil has supernatural ability to help him, to enable him to call fire down from heaven. That's why I tell people that they need to be discerning even when they're in the atmosphere of the miraculous. Is it of God, you ask yourself, or is it of the devil? Is it a false thing or is it a true thing? I shared with the group on Wednesday night after last week watching a PBS special on Jim Jones. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was startling. I've always wondered... How does a guy get 800 people to move from San Francisco, go to Guyana in South America, and then talk him into drinking Kool-Aid with poison in it and dying? I mean, how's a guy pull that off, really? who's, (laughs) Who's going to follow a guy like that? But this PBS special was so insightful. They had live footage and things, and he was doing, quote, the miraculous and healing and all kinds of things. It also came out in the thing that he was involved in sexual relations with many of the women in the church and many of the men in the church. It was a mind-blowing thing. And yet there was such an absolute authoritarianism in him that he, if anybody left, it was thought that it was the end of the world for them. They were all petrified and scared to death of this guy. But it was in the atmosphere of the miraculous which was either fake. In one case, a woman got out of a wheelchair and one of the 
people on, they were interviewing said, we found out later that was the secretary of the church and Jim had talked her into this big story that she was going to be healed and stand up and everybody was, you know, having a big hallelujah thing. Just because everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. God calls you and I as Christians to be discerning. Does God do the miraculous? Most certainly. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He heals. He has words for, of prophecy. He has, there's gifts of, of the miraculous sort. God does that. But the devil also can counterfeit and be deceptive. And so it's not only what the miracle is, it's what the message is. What's the message? If they saw the fire fall fall from heaven and then he says, now you worship this antichrist or this political leader, it should have been a no-brainer, right? It should have been a no-brainer. And yet look what the Lord says to the children of Israel in warning them to be discerning what the Lord says is going on in those circumstances. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, look at the screen, it's going to pop up here for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, Verses one through three, it says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is, notice this, testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The Lord told the children of Israel who had false teachers and false prophets and people said, oh, I had a dream. And and the dream was we were to go worship these other gods. At that point, you knew that if the sign or the wonder happened and they tell you to do something that is absolutely contrary to the scriptures, then you know that's that's the test. That's the test because he's trying to deceive us. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle in another passage of scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that this time of the Antichrist This is exactly what he's going to be doing. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason... God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The Lord says when the people reject him and his truth during the time of the great tribulation, they're going to believe this lie because God gives them over to what their heart desire is. Is They don't want to follow God. I've discovered something that's quite startling. When people reject the truth of who Jesus is. They turn their hearts away from his love for them, that he died on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead, and through faith in him, they can have forgiveness of sins and everlasting life, that simple gospel message. When they reject that and they say, that's old-fashioned, that's archaic, I don't want that old traditional thing, it's amazing what they'll believe after that. You might see them on a street corner and they're, you know, if you haven't traveled much, I mean, if you've ever seen the Hare Krishnas and their little orange robes and they shave their head and they got this little ponytail and they're out selling, you know, selling flowers or something, you just go, how does a person end up in an orange robe with his head shaved, selling flowers? I'll tell you how. By rejecting the truth of who Jesus is, you'll believe anything after that. You'll believe anything after that. And yet there are those who tell me, well, it, it's, it's real. I went to this, this palm reader or I got on the 1900 psychic line and they, they told me my future and all came to pass or, or this happened. I said, I didn't tell you it wasn't real. I said that it's false, meaning that it's wrong. You see, just because somebody can read a future like Paul the Apostle being chased around in Acts chapter 16 by that demon-possessed girl, she was a fortune teller. She was chasing them around, telling them the, the, the truth. She was following him, him and Silas saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. These are the servants of the Most High God. She went around town doing that for several days. And it says, I love this. It says, then Paul being greatly annoyed. I would have been greatly annoyed too, wouldn't you? And he said, he turned around and he said, I adjure you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. What was that demon that he cast out of her saying? That demon was telling the truth. The demon was telling the truth. Because if the devil can tell you 90 or 95% of the truth and he can slip you about 5 to 10% of the lie, 
He's got you. He's a deceiver. He doesn't come to you face to face. He's a liar. He's a liar. He's the one that's been lying to you in your life that you've been, you know, gratifying your own sin and temptation and and you think that there won't be consequences for it. See, that's the devil's temptation. It's always immediately gratify whatever your desire is and forget about the future. God comes along and says, deny yourself that sinful pleasure so that you might think about the future and seeing me face to face. It's the exact opposite. So this deceiver comes along, the false prophet. He makes fire come down from heaven. He also tells people to worship the image. They make this image, this idol, uh, that is placed in the new temple in Jerusalem. But then the false prophet supernaturally or technology or whatever happens, it's, it's a mind-blowing thing. Read it again in verse 15. It says, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The false prophet is going to set up, first of all, it seems like an idol that people are going to bow down to, but he's enabled supernaturally, demonically from Satan to bring breath to it, life, that the image can speak. You ever been to Disneyland and you've been to the uh, Mr. Abraham exhibit? Or maybe you went, you know, my favorite Pirates of the Caribbean, those cool dudes shooting their muskets. And that was old school technology, correct? It's like, looks like this person, this robot. What does technology in the future have? That this guy looks, sounds, breathes, talks as a duplicate of the Antichrist with the ability of clon- you, that we're headed towards with cloning and, and all of these different things. There are those who think it's a computer. There are those who think it's a, a robot. There's a, we don't know what it is. What we know is the thing breathes and it speaks and people bow down and worship it. And if you don't bow down and worship it, you die. It is a government mandated bow or die kind of thing like Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego experienced in Daniel chapter three. There where they they would not bow down. They would not bow down to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar. And if they didn't bow, they were gonna be thrown into the furnace and that's what happened, but God supernaturally saved them. Think about that just for a second here. If there was a government mandated thing today, you bow to this idol, you worship it, or you die. Not only you, but you have to really think about it in context, folks. You came here with your families, right? Some of you have those precious little kids, little Brooklyn that we just had a baby dedication for. It's not just you, it's, it's your wife. It's your little boy. It's your little girl. What if soldiers came in right now, which this is gonna be a time that those things are happening in the future, What if soldiers came in right now and they made every one of us file out of here, single file, one by one, and they put a gun to our head individually and said, are the bow to this idol or reject Christ? If you reject Christ, we'll let you out of this room. Or stay committed to Christ and we're gonna kill you. Would it be a stampede in here or would there be a a quiet attitude of worship? It's time to see you, Lord. It's time to see you. And I think in context, because of our American society, there are people that are giving their lives for their faith around the globe. Do you know that? And it's so far removed from us that I wonder oftentimes with the numbers of attendance as I was just sharing with you, the encouraging thing about so many people coming at Easter to hear about the Lord, but I have to share with you always my my quiet concern, how many of the couple of thousand people that come to Calvary Chapel and call Calvary Chapel their church, how many of them are really born again? How many really know Jesus? How many are, are coming because a friend wants them to or because maybe it's you know, kind of cool in their circle or whatever? How many know the Lord? You know, it's my desire that we be a people that are radically committed to Jesus. And this is a time in the future where the people's commitment is gonna be tested, gonna be tested with martyrdom. And I know that you and I sit here and, and think, oh, 
I don't know if I could do that. I think that way, don't you? I think, I don't, I don't know if I got my kids here. And, and it's one thing if they put the gun to my head, but what if they put the gun to my, my eight-year-old's head? Okay, well, go, go, wait, 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 wait. We don't know Jesus, just let us leave. And there is a time, the church in the church of Smyrna in, in Revelation chapter two, he talked about that church that was being persecuted and his encouragement was that he was, not that he was gonna deliver them, but he said, just be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. That was his encouragement. You just be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Folks, we don't have to fear death because it's just the beginning of a whole new experience. We've got new bodies. God's going to do a new thing. And I think this time is going to be so intense during the Great Tribulation because this guy that started off like the lamb, now he shows his cool, true colors. He's a murderer. Satan is a liar and he's a murderer. Always was, always has been, always going to be. Never changes. That's who he is. He wants to kill your life. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to rob you of the joy of the Lord. He wants to rob you of salvation. He wants to take you to hell. That's what he wants to do. And so the reality of knowing Jesus in good times and in bad times, now there's not only the desire to deceive, but also the desire to impress with the supernatural. But lastly, in verses 16 through 18, there's the desire to pressure through a different sort of pressure. Verse 16 says, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, everybody has heard, especially in the American culture, of this time in which there's going to be a mark on the right hand or the forehead. And we have to demystify it and also maybe take it out of the, the dark uh, kind of context. Think about it. It's just going to be as practical as, as your credit card in your pocket. Many people here today have automatic deposits, right? You don't even get the check. That's old school. I mean, you actually get a signed check. No, they put it in your bank account, right? You got the debit card. You don't even have to write checks, and, which I think is kind of cool. You don't even have to reconcile the thing. You just go online, check it. Oh, okay, I got money. Or I don't have money, whatever. And, and you just swipe the card. Years, years ago, 30 years ago, the church was very concerned when credit cards came around, around about 40 years ago. Because of the number system, the, the whole magnetic strip and the information and how money was transferred without cash. And there were churches that actually came out and preached against it. You shouldn't get a MasterCard. You shouldn't get a Visa or this or that. Folks, I just want you to know you're really safe with all your plastic. You may be in debt, but you're really safe with all your plastic in your wallet. But when they want to put that same identification on your right hand or forehead, you better be running for your life. Because it is at that point that it totally makes sense, doesn't it? If I, could be, if I was a salesman for the mark of the beast, oh man, I could market it. Don't you think? I'm a guy that loses my wallet. Lost my wallet last week. You ever lose your wallet and have that panic like, oh no, identity theft, my credit cards, all this stuff. And I went to the, you know, the, the fast food restaurant where I was. I thought maybe I left it on the table and the girls looked with me and we even pulled out one of those booths and we looked around. It was, it was on my desk where... After 40, this stuff's happening to me all the time. I, I think my brains have descended into my bottom because I'll go into a room, totally forget what I went into the room. Does that happen to you? Go into the room. What am I here for? When I go down and I sit down, I jar my brains and I go, oh yeah, and then I go back into the room. So, you know, you're absent-minded and this and that, and you want to have your, you want to have your driver's license. When I travel, I have to, my, my secret fear when I travel around the world is that, man, you lose your passport, you sunk. That passport's like, got, got my passport. I got my passport. So, okay, I got, got, my, got, my, got my passport. Okay, whoa. I got my, you know, when I travel with like, other people, you got your passport? You got, you've asked me three times, Rick, yeah, just get it. You got it? got to have it got to have your passport. You got to have your, all of that stuff. You got to have your cash. The easy way to fix all that folks is a process of identification. 
we already have social security numbers, we have I Idaho driver's license numbers, we have all of these different numbers. You have a member's number. If you, you know, I'm a part of a credit union, you have that number, you have all these numbers. But wouldn't it just be easier to have it right there and I'll, I'll just scan it? Or they'll, you know, scan it with your forehead, whatever. <laughs> Would you please, Ben? Beep. <laughs> Could you recheck that? <laughs> whatever the barcode system is, and there are those who have figured out, I, these are old school, but I got to show you a couple of clips. This is old school on a, uh, a little chip that was invented some time ago, and the little syringe and the reader. We got that? Yeah. This, this, is, this is old school. I mean, the new stuff that's coming out that I read about in the smart cards is just blows this stuff away. But this is the size of a grain of rice, this microchip. And you can put it... Uh, animal control people like uh, the dog pound and stuff, instead of doing dog tags for dogs, they can just inject this with this syringe, which let's show this syringe there. Little syringe, you just put it under the skin. The next one is the reader, which is like a scanner that you see at the store. You know, you just, just scan the thing. But look how old and old school and clumsy that is and now with the technology we have now. It is gonna be nothing, folks, for this to have a mark on your right hand or your forehead that eliminates all need of ID. The smart card that they use in France and Germany has the information of all their medical records, all their financial records. You, the, the history on their smart card is basically their entire life on a smart card. Now you can lose your smart card though. But you know, we say I'd lose my head if it wasn't attached. Well, your hand is attached and your head is attached. So we just need to take one more step. These things are talked about. I was reading about, there's lots of this stuff. And, and just to warn you a little bit, when you go online and search for some of this stuff, some of these prophecy sites are kind of bogus and, and, and wacko about certain things. But think about the pressure this would, would build if you cannot, as it says in verse 17, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. If this happened today, mandate, you know the mandate that's going on with uh, TV going digital, and oh, they moved it back because February 18th, people weren't ready. They still had their old analog you know, type of TV sets. And oh, woe is us if we can't watch Everybody Loves Raymond. So they put it off to June 12th, right? And we're going to go digital. I want you to know who's holding this up on the going digital. You people with VCRs with the blinking 12 o'clock that can never set your clock. You're holding this up, man, because you're not going digital. But you know, it's going to happen, and they're, they're advertising on the local TV stations, June 12th, that's the day. But think about it. What if the mandate was June 12th, that's only in two months, less than two months. In about eight weeks, the mandate is, if you don't have this mark on your right hand or your forehead, you can't buy a gallon of milk and some Cheerios for your kids, you can't get a tank of gas to go to work. You can't pay your bills. You can't go down and buy anything. Can you imagine all of a sudden your life as you know would totally freeze unless you stole, begged, or borrowed? And understand this, that pressure to do it. And most people go, oh, it's, it's really not that bad. It's not that big a deal. We've discovered next week in chapter 14 that those who take the mark of the beast, their fate is sealed. They're going to hell. Because that mark is what? The mark of the beast. It is the mark of the devil himself. They have taken the mark and they, there's no repentance from it. And so actually next week we'll see an angel cruises around telling everybody, don't take the mark, don't take that. I think that would impress people, but it doesn't seem to impress people. They don't want to hear about it. So what do we do when you think of those things? When is it going to happen? I don't know. There's a bunch of talk right now about 2012 being the year, the Mayan calendar and this and that. You might hear about it in work. People, somebody was asking me last night, Pastor Rick, what do you think about that? And I said, well, if somebody comes out and says it's 2012, then it's likely that it's not going to happen then because the Lord says nobody knows the day or the hour. They say, well, that's the year. That's not the day or that. That's true. But we'll know the time or the seasons. And so we see the seasons right now that where technology is at the place that all of this can happen, folks, like no other time in history. But understand this. The answer is in about 2012. Number one, I have encouragement for you. I believe the rapture of the church takes place before the great tribulation, so we're not even gonna see all this. Praise the Lord. 
Who wants to escape with me? I want to escape. Yep. There are those who are convinced otherwise. They, they plan on going through it. God bless you guys. We'll leave you behind to watch, watch the house, I guess. I don't know what to do. But we plan on getting out of here, okay? So number one, that's the encouragement. But number two, does that mean if all this stuff, some of you are, uh, uh, this makes you nervous, it makes you scared. I mean, as soon as you hear this stuff, you go, oh no, we've got to get prepared, honey. We've got to go buy camo and guns and ammo and, and food and, and survival things. And we've got to move to Bone and have Bone Calvary Chapel because not even officials will go to Bone, you know, and we've got to move out to Bone. <laughs> the Lord doesn't tell us to go buy camo. He doesn't tell us to go buy ammo. He doesn't uh, tell us to go become Rambo. He said, pray and watch for my coming. See, we're not watching for the Antichrist as Christians. For the Lord says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that he has not appointed us unto wrath. I am not, you are not, as a child of God, appointed unto his wrath. And the seven years of great tribulation is the time of the wrath of God. So that's the number one encouragement. Number two, say I'm totally wrong. You say oh, off base, we're going through the tribulation, Rick. Okay, I'll just, for the sake of argument, God will take care of his people. But how's he going to take care of us? I'm not going to bow, I'm not going to take the mark, and I'll probably have my head chopped off for my faith. And I'm ready. I don't, I mean, I'm not excited about that whole process. I just, I just don't, I hope, I don't, I hope they don't have the guy in training do it, you know? <laughs> you ever go to the restaurant, you get the, you, the, the, the waitress in training? I don't look at this. Hey, here's the guy in training. He's kind of a novice. He hasn't done too well with the last couple of days. Hey, can I get that pro just to you know, just make it quick? Just take me out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want him lopping off ears and, you know, maiming me or something. But the reality is, folks, the only thing that's important, you see, I'm ready for the Lord to come today. I'm going to be ready tomorrow. I'm going to be ready on Tuesday and Wednesday. And people say, well, what about 2012? I said, well, who cares about 2012? You ready to meet Jesus today, Right? As long as you're right with the Lord, you don't have to worry about the rapture because he's going to take you. You don't have to worry about the great tribulation and those things because he's faithful to take us out. And for those who have the other persuasion prophetically, he's able to give you endurance to lose your life. But the reality is, folks, I just want to encourage you in the days that we do live that we need to be a people of God that step up and we're following him today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about next week. Don't worry about if somebody's got a sword over our head or somebody, I mean, they, they pass this mark. of the. Don't worry about that stuff. Just make sure you're right with the Lord and it'll all be okay. The Lord will take care of it. You can trust him. The Lord does not tell us these things to terrify us. He tells us these things that we might know what's coming to let us know he's got it all under control and that we can trust him because he's got it wired. We're in good shape. If the Lord is, I love what David said in Psalm 23. Most people just think it's a good plaque. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down on green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's who he is no matter what, or no matter where you're at today. Let's pray. 